Well, I want to talk to you about Graceland. Uh, how many of you have heard of Graceland? Uh, you know, when I say Graceland, you might be thinking of uh, a 17,552 square foot mansion on 13.8 acre estate in Memphis, Tennessee, that was the home of the king of rock and roll, Elvis Presley. You know who I'm talking about? Everybody here heard of Elvis Presley? Just want to make sure I'm getting my audience right. Okay, everybody's heard of Elvis Presley. Okay, I, I, I know this little some obscure stuff that I'm talking about, but just want to make you sure. You know, this mansion actually, it was the home of Elvis Presley, and catch this, it is located at 3764 Elvis Presley Boulevard. What are the chances of that? The home of Elvis Presley, located on Elvis Presley Boulevard. I mean, is that, is that amazing coincidence or what? Um, you know, when I was looking at this mansion, I was thinking how actually modest it looks compared to these celebrity mansions you see nowadays. It kind of looks kind of quaint in a sense, doesn't it? It's quite something how uh, opulent things have become. But uh, it is now, of course, a tourist attraction. And this Graceland gets 600,000 visitors every year, probably not quite that many during COVID, but overall, it generally gets 600,000 visitors every year. And some of us more notable visitors have been the President George W. Bush hosting Japanese Prime Minister Kozumi, President Jimmy Carter, the former President of Costa Rica, Oscar Arias, uh, many governors and members of Congress, Prince William and Prince Harry, before they were married, um, with their cousins Beatrice and Eugenie, Princess Beatrice, Princess Eugenie, and Prince Albert II of Monaco. Of course, many musicians, including Paul McCartney and Paul Simon, who, Paul Simon, after his visit to Graceland, uh, wrote this title song of the uh, hit album, which is named after it as well, called Graceland. And so it's kind of interesting. You can visit Graceland yourself if you want, and that is you can do so, and you can get an ultimate VIP tour for $190 per person. That would be American, so that's about 365 Canadians. So, uh, but uh, that will get you in to be we, where we the king was, King Lib. However, um, so my message tonight is welcome to Graceland, but when I talk about Graceland, I'm actually talking about a different kind of Graceland. I'm not talking about the Graceland where the king of rock and roll live, but I'm talking about the Graceland where the king of kings lives. Are you hearing me? A different Graceland. And um, just as an aside, uh, some of you may know, but uh, there was one of one of his later concerts, Elvis Presley put on, he was, he was uh, singing and somebody put a sign up that said, Elvis is king. And he, and he stopped everything and said, listen, Elvis, I'm not king. Jesus Christ is king. I thought it was pretty cool, you know? But uh, in any case, that was a little bit of side. That's for free. You can share that with others. But my title of Graceland actually isn't really inspired by the mansion, but it's inspired by a visit I had with a fellow who used to attend New Life, and he's gone to be with the Lord now. He was in the hospital, and uh, he actually had been the lead guitar player for the uh, Christian rock band, band Servant. His name was Bruce Wright. And when I went to visit him in the hospital, he was suffering from lymphoma. And he, has, he was a really uh, great guy, and he had a very kind of uh, uh, interesting sense of humor. And so when he came in, he says, hey, Scott, how are things in pastor land? Nobody had ever asked me that question. How are things in pastor land? And uh, that, that, uh, that phrase stuck with me, pastor land. And so when I think of grace land, I think of it in those terms, grace land, um, because the King of Kings is in Graceland, and he has welcomed us into Graceland as well. It says in, in Romans chapter 5 and verses 1 and 2, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And so we have access into grace. We have access into Graceland. Now, when we think of grace, we've got to remember that grace has various forms. The Apostle Peter talked about this in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 10, where he said, each one 
should use whatever grace he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. So grace has various forms. And when we think of the kind of main forms of grace, there's three kind of main forms of grace that, that are a reality in Scripture. And the first form is unmerited favor. You know, the Bible says that God, we are his favorites, not because of anything we have done, but because of what Jesus has done for us, he has bestowed upon us unmerited favor. This morning, as I was in the Word, I was meditating in, in Luke chapter 7, and I was reading again of the woman who, it said, had lived a sinful life in the town where Jesus was having dinner at a Pharisee's house. And it was so, you know, I want to point out she had lived a sinful life. Anybody here lived a sinful life? Every single one of us have lived a sinful life. And it says that so she came to Jesus and she stood behind him at his feet, weeping. And then she began to wipe his feet, uh, wet his feet with her tears, uh, wipe them with her hair and kiss them and pour perfume on them. The Pharisee who had invited Jesus, his name was Simon, he was indignant. But what really struck me, that's a loaded passage of scripture, there's so much there, but the thing that just really struck me is how Jesus welcomed this woman who Scripture wants us to understand that she was very far from perfect, but he just loved her and welcomed her to him. And, uh, you know, I was thinking of the expression that we often think of Jesus, friend of sinners, because there's nobody else around but sinners. And, uh, and he welcomes each one of us, and he pours out his grace, and he said to her, um, woman, your sins are forgiven. The other guests at the house were, were scandalized by this. And then he said, woman, your faith has saved you. She had been given grace by her faith. She had accessed this unmerited favor of God. That's the first form of grace that we think of in the scriptures. The second form is gifting to serve others. Gifting to serve others. It says in, in um, Romans chapter 12 and verse 6, we have different gifts according to the grace given us. So each one of us is gifted differently. It's, it's really not a good idea to compare yourself to somebody else because they, they have a different gift than you. Don't feel like you should be like them or have to be like them. You know, be, be encouraged and, and prodded by their godliness for sure and be challenged by that. But as far as gifting is concerned, we have different gifts according to the grace given us. And so we see that the grace of God in our lives is not only unmerited favor, but it's also the bestowing of gifts on us. And within that, there are many different forms of grace, as is alluded to in the verse in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 10. And there's gifts of all kinds that the scriptures uh, uh, delineate, which we won't go into right now. But we understand that the gifts of God, the grace of God, again, it is given freely, a gift is a gift. It's not earned. And because of that, we understand that a gift is not our badge. You know, it says in 1 Corinthians 4, what do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as though you did not? So don't boast in your gifting. Boast in the Lord, right? He's the one who gave it to you. And praise the Lord. Use it for his glory, but don't find your boasting in it. Boast in him. And so we understand that we're not to boast in our gifting. We boast in the Lord. The second thing, we understand that the gifts of God are, are without repentance. They are, they are given to us, and, and we may use them for his glory, but we may use them for our own selfish ends. He doesn't take the gift away. It's given to us, and we have it. And so don't assume that if you see a gifted person that there is character underlying that gift. There may be, and there may not be. And we need to understand whatever gifting we have been given from the Lord, character is the foundation of that gift. And that's something that we work out with the Lord. And uh, he's the one who gives us the grace for character, but he's looking for partners in that process, right? So the gift's free, but the character is something that is usually happens through the fires and trials of life. Praise the Lord and the grace of God in our lives. Amen? The third form is the power of God. And I'd like to focus a little bit more on this form of grace as we're looking at the various forms of grace. See, God's grace is what gives us the ability to do, to endure, to enjoy, to overcome in ways that we otherwise would not be able to. It's the divine power to do that which would otherwise be humanly impossible. 
That's God's grace. And, um, and we see this grace is the great difference maker in our lives. It is the game changer. And we see it in Paul's life when he was asking God to take away from him a thorn in the flesh. And we, he, we, we get the account of this in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, where it says, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness. So we see that not only is God's grace his unmerited favor, and not only is God's grace the ability, giving us gifts to be a blessing to others, but also God's grace is his power in our lives. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That's so important for us to understand that God's grace is the power needed in our lives. And he says in this verse that his grace is sufficient. It was sufficient for Paul, and it is sufficient for you and me. Some synonyms of sufficient, it is adequate, it is enough, it is satisfactory, it is ample, it is plenty. All of these are synonyms of sufficient, and God's grace is that for you and me. The Greek word behind sufficient is defined in, the, in Vine's dictionary as to be sufficient, uh, to be possessed of sufficient strength, to be strong. I like this last phrase, to be enough for a thing. So God's grace in our lives is enough for whatever comes our way to be enough for a thing. God's grace. Now, there are all kinds of graces we saw, and it takes many forms. And just as there are different graces for serving or different expressions or forms of grace for serving, so also there are different forms of grace available for each situation we find ourselves in. And this is so important for us to understand as the children of God. In John chapter 1 and verse 6, it says, From the fullness of his, speaking of Jesus, from the fullness of his grace, we have all received one blessing after another. One commentator pointed out that the phrase one blessing after another is an attempt to express in modern English the Greek phrase grace in exchange for grace. So God gives us grace in exchange for grace. Now you will find in one season that you need a certain grace, a certain measure of grace, a certain form of grace for whatever it is that you find yourself in. And it is sufficient for that season, for that circumstance, for that situation. But then you find yourself in another situation and all of a sudden the grace that you were experiencing and was completely sufficient and adequate was enough is no longer cutting it for you. It's kind of like when, you know, if you think of it in terms of a vehicle, when you're a single person, you may be able to get away with a sports car. I used to have a Fiat X19 as a two-seater, and it was a great little bomb that I used to, you know, motor around in, but it wouldn't have done when I had a family. And so when it comes time where you have a change of situation, you need to trade in the old, which was great at one time, but it no longer works for the kitties, and so you're trading that in for a car, and then after a while, the kitties get bigger, and you might be trading it in for a minivan, and then when the kids grow up and move out, then you no longer need the minivan, and, that's, and you have an empty nest, and I feel that's when you should be looking at a Corvette. That's what I'm saying. I've been telling the Lord that, yeah, because my kids have moved out, and I say, I'm in the vet season now, right? But I, he hasn't heard that yet, so I, I'm, or hasn't really responded, so. But in any case, you know, what was good for this situation, now we need something here and something different here. I was just, I was walking to the office the other morning and uh, lots of people are riding bikes. There was, there was a, a father though, he had, uh, uh, he had on his back his kids, of the back of his bike, one of these bikes that has kind of a long uh, uh, rack on the back or it's right built into it, it's not an add-on rack. 
and he was driving them, riding them to school, and he had three kids on the back of his bike. I couldn't, I've never seen that before. It's his three little ones. But I'll tell you what, when they're teenagers, he's going to need a bigger bike, or he's going to need a bigger, he need a car. You know, what's good for right now may not be good for down the road. And so it is in this business of grace. What really works for us at one time, we find ourselves in a new situation, and all of a sudden, that grace that we are experiencing, so much blessing, so much power, so much overcoming grace in our lives, is not enough for now. And in those times, we are pressed in to find more grace from him. We are not only needing more grace, but we need a different form of grace for the kind of situation we're in. Can you relate to this? You were doing well, and all of a sudden, some came to your life, and oh man, you're rallying yourself. What you're needing in that time is an exchange of grace. The Apostle Paul obviously experienced this himself, because we saw in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 9 that he was crying out to God that he would take this thorn in his side away. Now, up till then, Paul was doing great. I mean, he was experiencing the grace of God, and it wasn't like he didn't have trials in his life. You read the book of Acts, you know that he had trials in his life almost from the get-go. But there came a time when this thorn in his flesh was introduced. The Bible doesn't say what it was. It doesn't give that, I'm, and I'm sure very purposely, very intentionally, so it's a, just open for us to take our own situation and put it in there. But Paul, he was doing well, and then this thorn in the flesh came into his life, and he's crying out to God, would you take it away? You see, the grace that was working for him before wasn't working for him now. He needed a fresh grace in his life. He needed to exchange the grace he had for new grace. He needed to trade in the sports car and get a minivan of grace because it just wasn't working for him anymore. And that kind of thing happens in our lives. The same principle for you and me. Sometimes, you know, pardon me, the sign, I don't know if you noticed on the way in, but we just put up a new sign and it says, need a new life, God accepts trade-ins. I thought it was a great sign. Need new life, God accepts trade-ins. Well, you want to know something? Need new grace, God accepts trade-ins. You need new grace, there is grace available. It's always there. It is free. It's available for you and me. Sometimes we can worry. What if this happens? Or what if that happens? I don't know if I could handle that. And you want to know the answer? You couldn't. You're right, you couldn't. But if it happens, and when it happens, there will be grace for you at that time. You don't need that grace right now. So you don't have to worry about it. Don't worry about it. What, wherever God takes us, whatever circumstance we find ourselves in, whether it be a trial, whether it be a ministry challenge, whatever it is, God's grace will meet us there. We need to understand that. I, I remember hearing an account of a, a, one of the early martyrs, and he was in his cell waiting to actually be executed, to be burned at the stake. And in his cell, there was a candle, and in anticipation of the next day, he, he passed his finger through the candle just to see how he was going to do, and he quickly pulled it out because of the pain. And he said, I don't know, I don't know how I'm going to do this. I don't know how, Lord, I'm going to glorify you. And, and the Lord said to him, my grace will be with you when you need it, and you don't need it right now. And when he was, when he was um, burned at the stake, he, he died praising the Lord, worshiping him. God's grace was there in the moment. You don't need grace for what might happen. You just can trust the Lord that whatever happens, God has grace for you in there. So we can understand and have confidence in the Lord that whatever happens down the road, there will be grace for us. But what's also so important for us to understand is that there is grace for us for what's happening today. Sometimes it's easier to believe I'm going to have grace for tomorrow, but maybe we need to think, do I have grace for today? And what we, God wants us to know, whatever is happening in our lives, he has grace for us. Now, some of us, many of us, maybe all of us in some measure, are going through a testimony. Testimonies are not given without drama. <laughs> Testimonies arise seeing God coming through in high-tension situations, where if he doesn't come through, it's going to be disastrous. Anybody ever experienced that? 
And if you are experiencing a challenging time where you really need to see God come through, then you're walking through a testimony. But what I want to declare to you today, that God has grace for you, and that is part of the testimony of what you're going through. He wants you to know that you have, he has grace for you, not just for what might happen tomorrow, but he has grace for what is happening today. You know, sometimes we can believe that God's grace, you know, like it was there for the martyr to die for the Lord, but we also need to understand that God's grace is needed and available to live for the Lord. Sometimes we can think, okay, God's grace may be there for tomorrow. We need to know that God's grace is here for today. Can I hear you say amen? amen. Now, accessing grace land, accessing grace land is the operative question. God, if your grace is there, how can I access grace land? Now, I told you before that if you wanted to go to the grace land in Memphis, Tennessee, it'll cost you $190 American to get in. But that's not the way you get in to this grace that we're looking at here as we get into the scriptures. It says in Romans chapter 5 and verse 2, as we looked at earlier, it says, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. Now, in the context of Romans chapter 5, it's talking about the form of grace of unmerited favor. But the same is true of any form of grace. In fact, Colossians 2.6 says, So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him. How did you receive Christ Jesus as Lord? By faith. You recognize your need, perhaps through a crisis. You realize your need for forgiveness. Maybe you realize your need for deliverance. Maybe you realize your need for a purpose or love or simply your need for God. Somehow there was a crisis that came into your life that prompted you to call out to the Lord. Perhaps it was through hearing the word. Perhaps it was through looking at yourself in the mirror. Perhaps it was your conscience in crisis. Perhaps it was all of the, the above. But there was some crisis of soul that came into your life that propelled you to cry out to God so you would access his grace. That's how you came to Christ, and that's the same way that you access the grace of God as his power. You recognize there's a crisis in your life in some way, either because you're just not getting the victory in a circumstance, circumstance you're falling on your face, or whatever it may be, but you are becoming aware that you have this need in your life, and that is designed to propel you by faith into grace land. And as you call on him in that situation, he will, he will answer you. You put your trust in Jesus. Maybe you've tried, maybe you tried other things before you were saved. Maybe you tried other religions. Maybe you tried self-help programs. But finally, you decided to follow Jesus and you put your faith in him. You know, it's true that as Christians, we can also try other things, can't we? We, we look here, we look there. And finally, the Lord says, what are you looking there for when you, I'm calling you to look at me? Because it's my grace that is sufficient for you. So we access grace land by faith. And, and what did you do after you recognized your need? You called on the name of the Lord. In Romans 10, verses 11 and 13, it says, as the scripture says, anyone who trusts in him puts their faith in him. Anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame as this for, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Perhaps there is no greater expression of faith than simply calling out to the Lord in prayer. That's how you came to him. Like it says in Colossians, just as you received Christ Jesus Lord, continue to live in him. And so just as we received him as Lord by faith and we called on his name, the same thing is true when you're in need of grace. There's no magic formula. It's the same God responding to you just as he did then. He was responding to you now. We need to understand that grace is available and we have access to grace land. It's not a complicated thing. It's simply God in our lives who brings that grace to us. In closing, Peter says in 1 Peter 5.10, he refers to God as the God of all grace. So whatever form of grace you're needing, whether you're needing grace for perseverance, 
whether you're needing grace to overcome sin, whether you're needing grace to be able to walk into forgiveness, whether you're needing grace to love someone, whether you're needing grace to serve the Lord and keep believing on him, whatever form of grace you are needing in your life, the source of all grace is God himself. He is the God of all grace. And as we put our trust in him, and as we call on him, he is faithful to answer us. And I believe that even the desperation of soul that comes into our lives is designed by him to experience a grace that we otherwise would not have experienced. And so because of this, as we saw earlier, the Apostle Paul says, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. He had found that although he tried to be strong in himself, actually he realized that the awareness of his weakness was an opportunity and a propelled him in to find the grace, power, and strength of God. And he found it to be so much better than any form of self-sufficiency he may have tried to walk in before that. His grace is available to everyone. He is the God of all grace. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, let's pray and ask the Lord just to take his word and minister into our lives. Father, I just want to thank you for your word. I thank you that you are faithful and you are the God of all grace. And Lord, I thank you that whatever any of us are experiencing right now, you have a grace for us for where we are. Now, Lord, I just want to lead us now. And I encourage you as I'm praying, would you just bring before the Lord, maybe you are aware of an area of your life where you are needing a fresh grace. You, you know, the old grace just isn't doing it anymore. You're needing new grace. And I just want you to open that to the Lord under your breath. Just whisper it to him. This is you and him now. I'm just helping you in prayer. So, Father, we just lift this before you, Lord. And we pray, Lord God, for fresh grace in our lives where we need it. We just know that you have said that we are to be over, you're called us overcomers and, and that we have more than victory in Christ Jesus. And so we pray and we put our trust in you and we just acknowledge that you, Lord, you are the God of all grace and our hope is in you. And Lord, we say yes to you. And not only do we ask for that fresh supply of grace, but Lord, we now in the name of Jesus say we receive it from you. Yes, by faith, Lord, we receive your grace into our lives, and we thank you for this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen.